have uh, honored guests today. Dr. Jacob Jones uh, comes to us most recently from UCLA. Uh, he's completing his second year of a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology. Uh, Dr. Jones also completed his doctoral degree in clinical psychology at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Um, also, I, I say this with great pride, um, don't usually mention uh, our candidates' undergraduate institution, but Dr. Jones also comes from a Cal State Channel Islands, so he's a Cal State graduate uh, as well. Uh, his area of uh, specialty is, as I mentioned, clinical neuropsychology. Uh, today his talk is on the cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms in Parkinson's disease, one of his uh, research and, clinic, and his clinical specialty area. And let's give him a warm welcome. A warm okay, so just sort of an outline of, of what I've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to talk about our first line of research, which mainly focuses on what are some of the underlying mechanisms of cognitive decline in Parkinson's patients, with a particular focus on the role of comorbid cardiovascular risk factors. There's been some previous studies which showing maybe they're not very important, but there are some weaknesses, so sort of addressing that line. And then thinking about with Parkinson's disease, you know, they have the motor symptoms, they also have a lot of non-motor symptoms, the cognitive impairment, mood symptoms. Um, in terms of the patient's perspective of their quality of life, which of those is most important for them? Then lastly, I'll talk about some work that I've been doing with open source data and longitudinal cohort studies. So it's open source, it's going to be, continue to be available to me. It's something that I could easily involve students in. Um, and I think it's very rich data in terms of neuroimaging data, neuropsych data, psychiatric and neurologic uh, workup. So I think it's going to be very flexible and um, getting individuals who are interested in, if they're interested in neuropsych, that's going to be a good fit for them. If they're interested in clinical, it's going to be a good fit for them. <clears throat> interested in health, that could be another fit. And then the sort of a longitudinal aspects so of maybe even quantitative psychology. Then most recently, I submitted an application for some, uh, some pilot funding to look at the microbiome. So if you think about the gut, the bacteria within the gut, the role that that plays in immune health, so does disruption of the gut bacteria lead to chronic inflammation, which then leads to cognitive and these structural changes within these patients? So as I mentioned, if we think about Parkinson's disease, the, most thing, that, the thing that's most salient are these motor symptoms. We can think about Muhammad Ali. He went from being possibly the greatest athlete of his time to later in life as the disease progressed. Uh, the tremor was very noticeable when he would make a fist. The slowed movements, um, we can see here the, oh, okay, the stoop posture, the lean forward, and the shuffling of gait, the dragging the feet. If we think about why there's a wide variety of motor and non-motor symptoms, you know, the brain is a circuit. If one area of the brain's damaged, it's likely going to be affecting other areas of the brain. So with Parkinson's disease, the hallmark impairment is degeneration of the substantia nigra. These are neurons that are very important for production of dopamine. Um, the theory is that by the time an individual has the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, they've already lost about 80% of the dopaminergic neurons. So we can see here these, dark, these nice dark lines. That's a healthy substantia nigra. They're losing about 80% of those neurons by the time they're expressing the motor symptoms. So what happens is when we take out the substantia nigra, we're disrupting these cortical striatal thalamocortical networks, or just for short, we just call them you know, frontal striatal networks. Um, and it's affecting areas of the brain that are important for motor functioning, so the premotor cortex. It's affecting areas of the brain such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is important for cognitive functioning, particularly executive functions, things like multitasking, organization, problem solving, these very fluid cognitive abilities. Uh, it's also affecting areas that are important for emotional processing, for mood. If we think about um, the orbital frontal cortex, think about Phineas Gage, when he was working with that tamping iron, went through his orbital frontal cortex, we saw some of those personality and mood changes with him. There is also disruption of the anterior cingulate, which is really important for motivated, goal-directed behavior, 
And so with these Parkinson's patients, there's going to be a subset which have a disorder of motivation. So an apathy, and sometimes it's an apathy with a comorbid depression, but sometimes due to the neurobiology, it's just going to be sort of a pure apathetic syndrome. And if we think about the mechanisms, just focusing on cognitive impairment for right now, we can think about the role of disruptions of these prefrontal systems due to the loss of the dopamine. Uh, another thought is that as the disease progresses, as the individual starts to develop a dementia, there is more of a posterior pattern of loss due to the disruption of the cholinergic systems. Um, we can think about the role of proteins, so Lewy body is the hallmark protein aggregate in Parkinson's disease. Early on, it's in the deep subcortical regions of the brain, and then as the individual starts to show some of these cognitive dementia signs, maybe that's the spread of these Lewy bodies to more cortical regions of the brain. Amyloid, which is traditionally associated with an Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's is a disease of old age, Alzheimer's is a disease of old age. There's going to be a large subset of individuals with this comorbid Alzheimer's pathology. And we should think that with the same line of, of thinking, vascular changes are ubiquitous in old age. Um, maybe this should be playing a role in cognitive impairment. So if we think about, is there an aspect of Parkinson's disease which should put these individuals at greater risk for vascular changes. Um, it's a complex relationship. There are actually aspects of the disorder which increase the cardiovascular risk, the cerebrovascular risk, and there are protective factors which decrease that risk. So the most obvious one is Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder, a disorder of mobility. They're less likely to engage in aerobic exercise and get that positive aerobic you know, cardiovascular protective factor. Um, on the other hand, levodopa, which is the most common medication for Parkinson's disease, it has an anti-hypertensive effect. And so frequently these patients, their anti-hypertensive medications need to be adjusted because there is this positive anti-hypertensive effect with the medication. So overall, it's not clear. Is Parkinson's bad for your vascular health? Is it good for your vascular health? It's probably a mixed bag, maybe in different um, uh, subpopulations within the disease. And so what the research has shown is there have been four studies which have looked at do Parkinson's patients with and without hypertension, do they have increased risk for dementia? Um, and all four studies were consistent in failing to find a relationship, and they actually drew conclusions such as cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease appears to be largely independent from this coexistent vascular pathology. So the literature is pretty clear that seems that hypertension and these cardiovascular risk factors aren't important for cognitive impairment. Um, however, there's some obvious sort of, uh, you know, weaknesses to this line of, of literature. Um, if we're looking at does a dichotomous hypertension variable predict a dichotomous dementia variable, uh, we know there's a lot more variability than just that. There's going to be individuals with subtle signs of cognitive impairment who don't necessarily have dementia. There are going to be individuals with hypertension, but they also have additional co uh, comorbid vascular pathologies. Um, so we can sort of adjust for this variability within those individuals. Also, most of those studies have been quite small, around 30 or so participants, and we know from the aging literature um, that we need more sensitive measures. And so for this first study, we had about 2,000 Parkinson's patients you know, from the National Parkinson's Foundation, a study that they did. And the obvious strength of the study is that they had about 2,000 um, participants. Um, the weakness of the study is that a goal from them was to collect a large variety of data with very little participant burden. So the measures that we have, um, they're relatively crude. The measure of heart and circulation problems, it was just a clinician rated measure. Does the patient have hypertension? How severe is it? Does the patient have diabetes? How severe is it? And then also our cognitive measures are also pretty crude. Uh, there was simply a memory test. If I say five words, after a couple minutes delay, tell me as many of those words as you can remember. And then our language tests are just relying on single, um, single language tests. So despite this sort of lack of sensi sensitivity, uh, we still found significant effects. So we found that individuals with greater severe um, heart and cardiovascular problems, they did have worse memory performance. Individuals with worse diabetes, they did have worse language performance. So it's some initial support, but keeping those weaknesses in mind, we did an additional follow-up study wanting to address some of these weaknesses. So all of these individuals, there was about 300, uh, 341 of them, they all underwent a full neuropsychological battery, 
So test of processing speed, test of memory and learning, test of executive functions. These are the tests that we think are going to be most sensitive to cardiovascular risk factors. That's what the normal aging study has suggested. These are domains, um, we can think of the sense that uh, cardiovascular risk factors, they have an affinity for the frontal subcortical white matter. So these cognitive domains, which are more reliant on those systems, they're going to be more sensitive to these cardiovascular risk factors. Um, we also did a full medical chart review. So we're not just looking at do they have hypertension, yes or no, but are they treated for it, um, and other sort of more uh, uh, different measures of cardiovascular risk. So overall what we found is that hypertension is indeed related to worse cognitive functioning among these patients. It was in the domains that we expected, the domains that we know are most sensitive to these cardiovascular risk factors, um, executive functioning, processing speed, learning and memory. And then we also found a pulse pressure by Parkinson's motor severity interactions. So that's what we see here. And so what this is, this is pulse pressure, um, higher values can be thought of as a surrogate term of greater arterial stiffness. So higher values mean worse vascular health. This is uh, cognitive functioning. Higher values mean better cognitive functioning. And here we have our four groups. You know, the purple and the yellow regression lines are the individuals with the most severe Parkinson's disease in terms of their motor symptoms. And the blue and the green are going to be individuals with the less severe motor symptoms. And so we can see that there's a little bit of an interaction here. We're clearly worse vascular health is related to worse cognitive functioning, but this is strongest for individuals with the most severe motor pathology. Um, so we're thinking that maybe there's an interaction between vascular pathology and Parkinson's pathology. Um, we did another study uh, testing this. So are Parkinson's patients um, at greater risk relative to healthy controls in terms of vascular related cognitive impairment, but also vascular related brain changes? So we looked at, this is called leukoreosis or LA. Um, there's a type of imaging method, T2 flare, which is very sensitive to these white matter changes. These, uh, these bright white, um, white, white spots, that's reflected of white matter damage. So those, that's not good. Um, it's thought that in chronic cardiovascular disease, there's sort of an incomplete infarct. So there's chronic hypo blood perfusion within the brain, the subcortical, very close to the ventricle. This area of the white matter is going to be most sensitive. Then as the disease progresses, it's going to spread out closer to the cortex. And so we're thinking about are Parkinson's patients at risk for cognitive impairment or for this imaging method of white matter damage. And so we had about 120 Parkinson's patients. Sorry, 120 participants. About half of them had Parkinson's disease and about half within each group had hypertension, about half were normotensive, and same thing for the controls. Once again, a full neuropsychological battery, test of attention, test of memory, language, executive function, and processing speed. So tests that we know are going to be sensitive to cardiovascular risk changes. We did a full medical chart review and we coded for the Framingham cardiovascular risk score. So this is a composite, composite measure of cardiovascular risk. We're no longer just focusing on hypertension. We're thinking about what's their blood pressure, are they on a medication, are they also smoking, or do they also have diabetes? So we're taking into account multiple cardiovascular risk factors, and then we can get sort of the risk that they're going to develop a significant cardiovascular event within the next 10 years. Um, for the imaging method, um, for these scans we have about 160, 180 um, slices per individual. There's about 40 slices per participant that are going to have them. We're going to see this LA in. And so we manually go through each slice for each participant, tracing around the, these hyperintense areas. We do that for an entire individual. Then we can look at total volume of white matter changes. We can also look at it in specific areas. So we expect that most of the white matter changes are going to be right around the ventricles, very deep within the brain. And then as the pathology becomes more severe, it's going to spread out into the deep white matter, which we see in white. And then the most severe individuals, it's going to be just underneath the cortex, which we see in red. So overall, there were, there were three findings. The first finding is not surprising at all. There was a main effective group. Our Parkinson's patients are performing worse than our controls in cognitive function. That's not surprising at all. Um, but we also found a main effect for cardiovascular risk 
And so we're finding that individuals with greater cardiovascular risk, once again, supporting our previous studies, that they're having worse performance in executive functioning, verbal memory, and processing speed. And specifically, we found a main effect with no interaction for those three domains. So we're interpreting that as, yes, cardiovascular risk, relates to worse cognitive performance. The extent to which that's true is relatively similar for Parkinson's patient as it is for controls. So it doesn't seem like there's much of an interaction there. For these three domains, which once again, these are the three domains that we know are most sensitive to vascular pathology. We did, however, find an interaction for our language domain. Um, but before we look at that, let's just look at a <coughs> quick way of depicting um, these main effects. So we have our four groups here, Parkinson's patients with and without hypertension. On our y-axis we have what percent of individuals have mild cognitive impairment, which is in blue. So mild cognitive impairment, it's a diagnostic um, you know, entity. We're trying to get individuals who have some signs of cognitive impairment. It doesn't matter which domain it's in. And so we can see this nice stepwise, almost a linear gradient where certainly our Parkinson's patients are, are having worse cognitive performance than our controls, but that's going to be particularly true for our last group, which has this comorbid vascular risk factor. Uh, and then I mentioned for language, we found an interaction effect. So once again, on our y-axis, um, cardiovascular risk, higher scores mean worse vascular disease, cognitive functioning, higher scores mean better cognitive functioning, we see that for our controls in green, there's no relationship. This is actually a common finding within the normal aging literature. As I mentioned, cardiovascular risk factors, they have an affinity for the deep subcortical frontal white matter. Um, and so when we have language, we think of that as more of a posterior cortical cognitive domain. So it's not surprising that language, language uh, functioning isn't going to be the most sensitive to these cardiovascular risk factors. However, in our Parkinson's disease patients, we did see the sort of, you know, the, the effect that we've been seeing, that individuals with greater cardiovascular risk, they have worse cognitive performance. And we were particularly excited about this finding because there's been some recent literature which has looked at, if we look at newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease, and we want to know um, what cognitive domains are going to be the most risky for developing dementia quickly, so who's at the greatest risk, for a rapid onset of cognitive decline, it's individuals with this more posterior cognitive profile. So individuals with language, um, language impairments, also visual spatial impairments. So likely, based on that finding, we would expect that these individuals, if we were to follow them longitudinally, these are the individuals who are going to be at the greatest risk for developing a rapid onset of cognitive decline. So this time if we look at um, you know, our imaging metric, um, without spending too much time on it, um, the general finding is that we found the expected uh, direction for our controls. So in green, we can see this is clear relationship. Individuals with more white matter pathology, more white matter change, they're performing worse on our cognitive measures, but there is a flat line for our Parkinson's patients. And so the general idea, and I'll go into this in a little bit, a little bit more in, in just a couple slides, is that our Parkinson's patients were relatively healthy in terms of the amount of white matter changes that they had. Okay. And so there may be a little bit of restricted range. They were a healthy sample. They weren't showing a lot of these white matter changes. And so maybe that's where we're not finding this significant relationship in them. Um, so overall, these three studies, they've been very consistent. Cardiovascular risk factors, they are important for cognitive functioning. That actually, you know, it's a very important finding because the previous studies have sort of been suggesting that hypertension is related to cognitive impairment. And that's been focusing on more of this, you know, looking at more severe cognitive impairment, looking at dementia. But when we look at a more refined measure, specific cognitive domains, we are finding these effects. Um, we're finding that the extent to which cardiovascular risk factor um, to which they relate to cognitive impairment, it's relatively similar for Parkinson's patients as it is for controls, um, except for um, our language ability, we did find that interaction effect. So it's likely if we were to follow these individuals, these individuals with this additional vascular pathology, they may be at risk for a more rapid onset of cognitive decline. Um, so we didn't find a relationship between our measure of white. Yeah. So um, PD patients are not showing a loss in white matter. 
So they are showing some changes. So I think this, this might be answering your question. Um, and part of it is our sample is healthy. Um, so there was a review. So we didn't find a relationship. We didn't find that individuals with greater vascular white matter changes had worse cognitive performance. Um, there was a review, and there's a lot of discrepancy in the literature. The general finding is you're more likely to find a relationship if there's more severe Parkinson's disease or more severe white matter changes. And so this was a study by Kate Price, who's at the University of Florida. Um, in healthy older adults, she was asking, of your total white matter, how much, what percent of your white matter needs to be damaged before you show signs of cognitive impairment? And she generally found that you need to have at least 3% of your white matter you know, damaged or hyper-intense on these images before we start to see cognitive decline. And so in our sample, our Parkinson's patients, only about 1% of their white matter is damaged. So they're pretty healthy. Um, this is another study. So there's been past studies which have shown that Parkinson's patients with this greater white matter change does relate to cognitive impairment. And they have about two to three times as much white matter changes as <coughs> So certainly our group seems to be very healthy. Um, we certainly didn't have anyone in our group who had sort of this level of a, of a white matter pathology. And in a way, it may make sense. If you think about the role of white matter in cognitive functioning, um, it's, disrupt, it's disrupting connections between gray matter structures. They can no longer talk. In Parkinson's disease, there's already disruptions of those gray matters. There's this dopamine loss. So if the caudate can no longer talk to the DLPFC, um, if you disrupt that white matter, maybe it doesn't matter because there's already disruption within the gray matter. Um, so maybe there's sort of a lack of sensitivity. The other thing is that the measure that we used, uh, looking at these hyperintensities, it isn't the most sensitive measure of white matter integrity, so we could use what's called diffusion tensor imaging. And so now I'm going to talk about some other studies that have, done that, have used this, uh, this metric. And so the most common metric of, uh, of DTI is what's called fractional anisotropy. The basic you know, conceptualization of FA is that we're looking at the dispersion of water molecules throughout the white matter bundles. If all of the water is flowing in a single gradient, single direction, that means we have a nice, healthy white matter bundle, uh, nice myelination. And as we start to see signs of degeneration, the water is spreading in multiple directions. Okay, So that's FA. High FA, nice and healthy, and then we start to see signs of degradation. We can look at different white matter tracts, so different areas of the corpus callosum, then just above it, different areas of the cingulate, different areas of the internal capsule, and a lot of other different major white matter structures. So we looked at, within patients with HIV, we looked at what's called IIV, so intra-individual variability. It's just as the name sounds, if we give an individual five different cognitive tests, you know, conceptually, what's the standard deviation? Is there a lot of var variability within those tests, or are they all kind of clumping together? And we think that this is going to mirror what we do clinically in terms of our neuropsych assessment. We look for relative weaknesses. And so if this was a patient, you can see that there is a clear relative weakness on tests two and four. And likely we would come to the conclusion that this probably represents some sort of sign of change, some sort of sign of a neurologic process. And likely this person used to be, you know, closer up here. Okay. This individual, if uh, if the Y metric is a is a Z score, even though on average this individual is about three quarters of a standard deviation below the mean, we can see that there is a nice sort of pattern. They're all they're all closely clumped together we would probably say that this is a long-standing weakness. This isn't a sign of degradation. It's just where this person naturally falls. We know that some people are just going to naturally fall three-quarters of the standard deviation below the mean. And so, once again, we think this may be an important metric in HIV patients because the pattern of cognitive impairment in HIV is a little bit spotty. Some individuals are going to have impairment in processing speeds. Some won't, but they'll have impairments in memory. Some won't, but they'll have impairments in uh, executive functions. So this is going to capture variability regardless of what domain is weak, regardless of where the relative weakness is. So we examined this longitudinally in our HIV patients. Um, so here we have changes in IIV. Is the person's cognitive performance going to become more dispersed over time? That's the positive values. And then we have um, time to predicted 
uh, fractional anisotropy within the superior longitudinal fasciculus. That's just one of the biggest white matter bundles within the brain. And we see that for our controls, there's no relationship. So changes in IIB don't relate to changes within white matter integrity. But for our HIV individuals, we see that there is a relationship. As our cognitive performance becomes more variable, that is sort of a canary in the coal mine sign that there's something neurologic going on, particularly within the white matter. Okay, so these individuals are going to be at risk for degradation of the white matter, a sign that there is a neurologic process going on. Uh, this is a study I did when I was at Brown. Um, we're looking at, it's another DTI metric, it's called um, MWF, myelin water fraction. The only thing we need to know about this is it's just going to be a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more specific than FA in terms of myelin changes. And so we looked at this in Alzheimer's patients because the traditional thinking of Alzheimer's disease is that it's a disease of gray matter, okay? So there are white matter changes, but it's sort of a passive view of these white matter changes. There's going to be changes within the hippocampus, changes within other gray matter structures, and then the white matter is going to degenerate after the fact because it's no longer receiving this trophic support. The newer view, or a newer view, uh, poses a more active role of myelin loss. So when there's myelin loss, that's associated with greater neuroinflammation, blood-brain barrier de de uh, degradation, and greater um, production of cholesterol. So it contributes to this, what's called an infracortical toxic environment. It makes it more likely that the amyloid and the tau, which are the two main hallmark uh, you know, pathologies in Alzheimer's disease, that they're going to be producing and clumping together. So we wanted to test this in a spectrum of individuals. Um, from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment, so there's subtle signs of an Alzheimer's pathology, but they're not dementia, they're not showing functional changes in their day-to-day -day life in the individuals with um, Alzheimer's. And so this is a different analysis. Um, we're not looking at specific predefined structures, rather this is very spatially sensitive. We have a white matter skeleton, and we're examining the relationship between MWF and cognition within each pixel. So it's very spatially sensitive, and then we can look at this and say that there seems to be a general, more posterior cortical pattern of myelin, uh, myelin uh, disruption, which relates to worse performance on our cognitive measures. So we're finding support that indeed, this myelin loss may be important for cognitive function, it may be an active role uh, within the Alzheimer's disease process. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and uh, now talk about some of these studies that focus more on quality of life. Um, going back to Parkinson's disease, they have a lot of different kinds of symptoms. The motor symptoms, the mood symptoms, the cognitive symptoms. Which of those are going to be most important for the individual's perspective of the quality of life, of how they're doing? Um, so this was a review article that came out and uh, it, it reviewed the... the the role of apathy in Parkinson's disease, I mentioned before, um, apathy is likely to be a core construct of a Parkinson's pathology because of disruption of these brain areas which are really important for motivation and goal-directed behavior. Um, so it seems that apathy is really going to be a marker of neurologic impairment. Um, but despite that, they brought up that none, there's been no study which has investigated whether or not apathy is related to quality of life of these patients. So they question, is apathy a meaningful clinical construct? And the lab that I was a part of in, uh, in Florida, you know, they were a big apathy player, so they, they, they literally like gasped at the idea that apathy wouldn't be a meaningful clinical construct. So we readdressed this. Um, so once again, we can think about apathy being separate from depression because of this neurobiological role. Um, indeed, there could be individuals who present with sort of a pure dysphoria, classic depression, individuals who show this lack of motivation, but they're not dysphoric about it, they're not distressed about it, and the individuals are sort of a mix, apathy and depression. And so we wanted to think about how is apathy, how is depression, um, as well as anxiety, how do they predict quality of life within these patients? We had about 100 individuals in the early to moderate stage. Um, if we did a regression analysis, which of these mood constructs um, is going to be most predictive of quality of life? Um, 
the key here is that apathy, pure apathy, is not in here. So it doesn't seem that apathy seems to be a big driver of quality of life, but rather it is anxiety and dysphoria and a mixed depression. So this is just sort of the first study. Um, we also looked at different domains within quality of life, so we're going to think about total quality of life, but also how, how has Parkinson's disease affected your activities of daily living, how have they affected your cognition, uh, your mobility, and so forth. And so when we look at these different domains, uh, the general pattern, once again, is apathy is only coming up once as a significant predictor, whereas sort of a pure depression or anxiety is coming up much more often. So similar finding, apathy may be less important than these other constructs to quality of life. Uh, in those regressions, we also looked at the role of measures of motor severity. Um, they were not significant predictors of quality of life. Um, but we did look at cognition, so we did another study really focusing on cognition. Um, for this paper, as I mentioned, we can measure quality of life within different domains. We particularly focus on the cognitive domain, because it would make the most sense that individuals with cognitive impairment should be reporting perceived difficulties in cognitive tasks of daily life. They should be reporting that they're forgetting stuff, um, that they're not paying, they're having difficulties with attention and so forth. Um, and so that's what we expected, but that's not what we found. Um, we found that there was a very small correlation between any of our measures of cognitive functioning. I think we had, you know, we had at least 10 measures of cognitive functioning. They were all very minimally correlated with this quality of life, this perceived perception of how your cognitive functions are. And if we see, you know, how do our neuropsychological domains contribute to quality of life relative to depression, once again, it's depression which is really driving how a person perceives they're doing. And in a way, this may not be surprising. People with depression, they see everything through a dark lens. Everything is negative. So if we ask them, how's your cognitive functioning doing? It makes sense. They're probably going to say that it's doing poorly. So once again, just coming back to this model, you know, the story seems to be that it's mainly depression, which is driving quality of life. Uh, so in another follow-up study, we. Um, we tested this in a longitudinal study. So this is a structural equation modeling uh, that we did. Um, we parsed out the between subject factors, the intercepts, versus the, the slopes or the within subject factors. So we're thinking about, uh, we measured individuals, their quality of life, these mood constructs, across 18 months. And so across those 18 months, individuals who on average reported worse quality of life are they also reporting worse motor functioning, worse apathy, or depression? And if we look at changes, individuals who have a worsening in the quality of life, is that because their motor functioning is worsening, their apathy is worsening, or their depression is worsening? Overall, once we found again, you know, by now you probably have the story. It's depression, it's not apathy. Um, but if we look here, we see that the, you know, the standardized beta, it really is depression much more than these other meaningful constructs. So it's not the degree of their motor severities or their age or their male or their gender. So males were at greater risk or had uh, reported a worse quality of life. It's really driven by depression between subjects and then within subjects. Once again, it's really driven by worsening of depression. And apathy was not a significant predictor. If we want to know what that looks like, um, on our y-axis, we have difficulties with quality of life, so higher scores mean you're having more difficulties. Uh, these four groups, these top two groups, are individuals with severe depression. The top group has also severe motor symptoms. The bottom group has less severe motor symptoms. These are individuals with less severe depression. Once again, more severe motor symptoms and less severe motor symptoms. So we see the effect of depression is huge, much bigger than the effect of, of motor functioning. And we can see that over time, these individuals are reporting decreased depression, so their mood is improving, and sure enough, um, they're reporting fewer difficulties in quality of life over the 18 months. If their depression is worsening, uh, they're reporting greater difficulties in quality of life. So overall, these studies were very clear. Um, you know, our Members of the lab were necessarily happy with them, but they were very clear that apathy um, was not a strong predictor of quality of life. Um, and so in a way, that may not be all that surprising. Uh, this is an EEG study I was able to, uh, to be a part of um, with Margaret Bradley. 
um, and other individuals at the University of Florida. And so it's looking at what's called the LPP, the late positive potential, which is an EEG signal which is sensitive to emotional processing. So if you view pictures, you're going to show greater emotional processing to positive pictures, so nudity or yummy food or cute puppies and stuff like that. And you're also going to show greater emotional processing to negative pictures. So insects, you know, snakes, uh, violent scenes, and so forth. So Parkinson's patients, if you <coughs> don't have apathy, you show that effect. If you have apathy, you show normal um, increased emotional processing for positive pictures, but not for negative pictures, which we see here. We see the apathetics um, with Parkinson's disease. They show less enhanced emotional processing to negative pictures relative to individuals who aren't apathetic. And so we can think of apathy as not a disorder of our hedonic systems. They're able to engage and process positive, um, you know, joyful events, um, but it's more of a deficit in response to threat. And so this is very consistent with what we see clinically. Um, patients may come in and you know, and they're experiencing greater medical bills, they're no longer working because they have this degenerative disease. Uh, but if you ask them how they're doing, they're saying, oh, I'm doing fine. They're not doing anything all day, so that's why I may be rather doing fine. Uh, but this is gonna be very important for caregiver burden. So the individual is no longer as independent as they used to be. Um, and sure enough, there's been studies in Alzheimer's disease that apathy is important for caregiver burden. So it doesn't mean apathy, is apathy not an important clinical construct? Um, we would argue that it still is. This is some other work. Um, this one I was involved in. We show that individuals with um, mild cognitive impairment, they had greater symptoms of apathy. So apathy is related to cognitive impairment. This is a study by a different um, student within our lab looking at the trajectories. Um, so apathy and motor symptoms, they follow similar paths, whereas depression follows a different path. So it's really suggesting that apathy, cognitive impairment, and motor symptoms they all represent a single, or at least a, a similar underlying mechanism, most likely this frontal subcortical disruption of the dopamine systems. Whereas apathy is likely related to other constructs, um, possibly a sort of a psychosocial, um, you know, you've been diagnosed with a debilitating degenerative condition, or there's even some evidence that's more of a, a norepinephrine uh, system. Yeah? Is there a correlation with um, severity of Parkinson's and of depression? Um, there, the stronger correlation is with apathy than it is for depression. Um, this study is actually suggesting that, so these aren't newly diagnosed Parkinson's patients. So let's keep that in mind. But it suggests that there's, there's a, you know, it's, it's not a linear effect. There's going to be ups and downs. Sort of makes sense. Um, you know, that's, depression is a very, you know, fluctuating condition. Um, I think there has been some work in newly diagnosed Parkinson's patients that early on, you've just been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you're going to report depression, and there's sort of a little bit of adjusting um, as time goes on, so it's just sort of this nonlinear early bump, then decline, whereas with apathy, it tends to get worse over time. Yep. The apathy scale itself, mm -hmm. um, it might help with so if you can yep. remember some sample items, yep. and specifically, are the... Is apathy measured in the context of a terminal disease, mm -hmm. or is it measured? Yeah, they, they've all been validated within Parkinson's disease. Okay. Um, some of the, you know, one of the items is simply, are you apathetic? So you know, yeah. <laughs> um, other items are, do you have loss of motivation? Um, do you need someone telling you to get up and do things? Um, I actually might have them on another side if you want to get them at the end. But yeah, sort of like that. You know, they're they're pretty um they're pretty face valid, uh, especially the are you apathetic yeah. term. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of it's going to be with motivation, um, planning a little bit like that. Okay. Okay. Um, so they've been validated within Parkinson's disease, but they're also used. They're used within the HIV literature. They're used within normal aging, and so forth. Um, so. Thinking about these studies, um, these are the longitudinal co cohort studies where I'm using open source data. Uh, two of them are focused on HIV, one of them is focused on Parkinson's disease. And so I just want to quickly show you so we can get a sense of the richness of the data. 
So this first one with HIV patients, we had about 1,300 patients. And once again, we're focusing on quality of life, what's the longitudinal relationship between cognition and quality of life. And sure enough, we found our expected effect. Um, there are between and within subjects factor um, as, as quality of life declines, cognition also declines. But one thing I was excited about is we found a unidirectional lag relationship. So uh, worse cognitive performance predicts subsequent changes in quality of life, subsequent decline, but declines in quality of life do not predict future changes in cognitive functioning. So it's suggesting that cognitive impairment is preceding and really driving these declines in quality of life. It's not that the individual is experiencing quality of life and something else is driving the cognitive impairment or that the quality of life is driving the cognitive impairment. It seems to have more, um, there's more uh, evidence for certain directionality of this relationship. This is also an HIV. Um, if we think about IIV, once again, the variability in cognitive performance. Um, we looked at what's called hand diagnostic outcomes. This is just the HIV version of MCI. Does the person have mild cognitive impairment? Um, and it's just within HIV. They like having their own name for it. Um, so it does greater variability in cognitive functioning relate to a worsening of these cognitive diagnostic outcomes as well as does it, uh, does it predict mortality. Um, we found that's true. Um, greater dispersion of cognitive performance does predict um, conversion to a more severe cognitive pattern. And if we look at the odds ratio, it's really driven by this variability in cognitive function, not mean level cognitive function. If we gave you 10 tests and we just average all those tests, you know, it's not very predictive of transitioning within this. Um, also, we think about CD4 count, which is the severity of their HIV. Um, you know, IIV is the much bigger predictor than these other important outcomes. And it's the same pattern. This is for hand. It's the same pattern of looking at mortality. IIV is going to be very predictive of it. So once again, IIV seems to be this canary in the coal mine finding. It's a sign of something neurodegenerative going on. So this is the, the Parkinson study, um, it's the longitudinal study. I've talked about MCI. The, the promise of MCI is that we're going to identify individuals at risk for dementia and show they're showing subtle signs of cognitive impairment and they're likely going to be showing declines later on. The, and the literature has shown that about 2 to 31% of individuals with MCI will develop dementia within a year. However, about 13 to 25% of individuals with MCI will be cognitively normal within a year. So it pretty much means if you have MCI, there's a chance you're going to be demented within a year. There's almost an equal chance that you're going to be cognitively normal within a year. So that seems like a problem. Um, and so we looked at this in a longitudinal cohort um, of Parkinson's patients. Um, and so if we have five years of data. If we look at the first two years of data, there are going to be some individuals who are cognitively normal those first two years, and some individuals who revert. They were mild cognitive impairment, but now they're cognitively normal. Are those individuals, are they out of the woods? Are they no longer at risk for cognitive impairment? Or are they likely to redevelop cognitive impairment at a quicker rate at our third and fourth years? And so this is at the third annual outcome. We see that these individuals, um, well, let's start here. We see that individuals who were stable within the first two years, they were cognitively normal. The majority of them, they continue to be cognitively intact at the third year. But we see that for these individuals who were mild cognitive impairment, then they are now cognitively intact. They're likely to reconvert to cognitive impairment or even dementia. So there's a greater risk that that improvement in cognitive functioning, it's only going to be temporary. They're still at risk. It was um, this pattern for the third an annual follow-up, same pattern for the fourth and fifth. Um, it's really lending credence to the clinical utility of MCI, that even if the MCI diagnosis is not stable and you revert, you're still at risk relative to individuals who are never meeting criteria for MCI. Um, so I think, this, uh, I think the Parkinson's patient is going to be very rich. Um, I think there's a lot of other future directions I can go with this. So we think that the we think that by the time individuals who revert, they were cognitively impaired and then they're cognitively normal, we expect that there's going to be something different in terms of their structural anatomy um, within the brain. 
because they're already showing signs of cognitive impairment. And it doesn't mean that they're improving. It doesn't mean that their brain's improving. It's just that our measures aren't perfect. There's some error. So likely we're going to be able to detect differences um, on maybe some of our neuroimaging methods. Um, I mentioned that apathy has been shown to be related to cognitive impairment. Um, all those studies have been cross-sectional, so I think this gives us a chance to see do individuals with apathy relative to individuals with depression, are they on a rapid, uh, steeper decline in terms of their cognitive impairment? Uh, I mentioned that Parkinson's disease is primarily a disorder of frontal dopaminergic disruption. There's been some literature suggesting that individuals with an additional frontal and a more posterior um, pattern of cognitive impairment should be at greatest risk for dementia. We can actually look at that not just in terms of the, or the neuropsychological profile, but in terms of the neuroimaging. DTI is going to be a great way to look at these frontal to posterior connections. Are they degradating? Is there a sign that there's something going on? Um, and I'm also interested in the role of, in, of uh, inflammatory markers in Parkinson's disease, which would be available, because I recently uh, submitted an application to investigate the gut microbiome with the Parkinson's patients. And so the gut microbiome is important for immune health. And there's been studies showing that Parkinson's patients, before they even have the motor symptoms, they're showing disruptions within the, the microorganism, the microbiome, within their stomach, within their gut. And so we're going to test the hypothesis that this disruption of immune health, of gut health, leads to chronic neuroinflammation, which then subsequently leads to brain changes and cognitive impairment in these individuals. Um, we're going to get data on about 30 um, Parkinson's patients is what we propose. Most of this data is going to be pretty autonomous in terms of the collection. So even if I'm no longer at, at UCLA, uh, I'm certainly going to be able to still be, um, you know, still be the PI and involved in the study. The neuropsych, the imaging, it's all going to be collected as part of routine clinical care. And then what we're proposing is um, to get money in terms of analyzing the stool samples, looking at the diversity of the microbiome, abundance of certain bacteria which have this negative uh, increased neuroinflammatory effects, and then look at the specific neuroinflammatory markers on their own. So I think this data is very versatile, it's very rich, it's going to be useful for students who have interest in neuropsych and useful for individuals with interest in, in clinical um, populations. When I was an undergrad, um, you know, I had not just difficulties, it wasn't possible for me to get um, experience with clinical populations. I think that's a common, um, a common experience when there's not a neurologic department, a neuropsychiatric department. This is going to be a way that students are going to get um, experience with these populations. They're going to get experience with the neuroimaging analysis. And I think it's going to make them very um, competitive for the programs that value this stuff. So I want to thank um, all my collaborators. I've been very lucky to have some, some wonderful uh, uh, mentors throughout the year at many different places. Uh, I want to thank the funding sources and mostly for all of you for your attention. And sorry for taking up most of the time, but I'll answer any questions that you might have. Find correlation. So, did you find in the in the non Parkinson's population a correlation mm -hmm. between those sort of prefrontal executive function mm -hmm. cognitive deficits mm -hmm. and hypertension? Mm -hmm. um, yes, we actually tested a, a mediation model, and it came out perfectly with our controls. That um, individuals with greater cardiovascular risk factors they have cognitive impairment, and that's mediated from the white matter changes. So, I'm wondering whether or not, in general particularly those executive function problems, mm -hmm. um, like being able to control one's thoughts and actions, how that causally relates to hypertension. Uh, it's certainly so, good. Yeah, no, our data is all, all cross-sectional. So it would make sense. We know that clinically, individuals with, you know, it's going to be those executive functions which are going to be the greatest risk for medication and adherence, for functionally, you know, forgetting to pay the bills. It's not, it's not memory, it's organization, which mm -hmm. is going to be most important for that. Mm -hmm. So certainly they're going to, you know, if they're not taking their antihypertensive medication, if they're taking too much of their dopamine medication, their levodopa, then they're having declines within their, their blood pressure, maybe they're experiencing what's called orthostatic hypertension. You go from sitting to standing, there's a drop in blood pressure. And the theory is that chronic drops in these blood pressure can sort of lead, once again, to sort of an incomplete stroke.
Um, the literature hasn't always supported that. But that's sort of the idea. So yes, it could definitely be a circular relationship. Hypertension leads to cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment worsens, you know, medication adherence, which leads to greater cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah. You put up more inflammatory markers. So, <laughs> um, is there much research looking at those and PD and how those changes may um, uh, fluctuate versus PD? No. Um, Okay. There, there's very little research yeah, in know, general, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly within within human research. Um, there's been some, you know, there's sort of a, a fragmented fragmented uh, line that, uh, you know, these early gut changes lead to inflammatory changes. Those inflammatory changes lead to cognitive or yes, cognitive impairment. Some studies have also suggested they lead to structural brain changes, but nothing has sort of looked at that, um, you know, that continuum. But most of those studies, you know, it's really about N of 20. So it's a very small scale. Um, the microbiome is a very new, um, in a way it's a very innovative, but there's also not much, especially very little human research. Most of the human research in that relating to cognition, relating to structural brain changes, is uh, there's like two studies in IBS, and so that's sort of in the, in the, you know, the scope of that. Are you looking further at your one interaction, or are you looking at that as being more artifact? Because I was curious about the language domain that you mm -hmm, measure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what specifically is assessed yep, yep. in the language. So, domain. so one of those tests is confrontation naming. If I show you a picture, can you name it? Some of the easy items. If I show you a horse, can you name the horse? If I show you an abacus, can you name an abacus? Um, and then the other measure, and we just average these two measures together, is uh, animal fluency. So it's not just language, it's language and processing speed, because you have to think of words quickly. Um, and we actually looked at those um, those tests separately, and it was really the naming that was really driving it. Um, so it's really suggesting that it is sort of this posterior cognitive domain. Um, but we have not looked at that um, further. That seems to be very, you know, the idea is that those individuals are going to be at greater risk for cognitive decline. So that's certain, certainly something I'm going to want to look at in a longitudinal study. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the, the PPMI data, the longitudinal Parkinson's data, is it's just going to take a lot of manpower to, um, uh, to account for the medications. They're in there, but, uh, but they're not organized. So it's going through, you know, picking out all the statins, picking out all the, you know, the brand names for hypertension. And so that's something that I could use the manpower with. Is that um, wink, wink for our students? <laughs> <laughs> that's in the open source. Sometimes yeah. that's how the data is. Yeah, there. and so could I do it without the medication piece? Uh, I could, but it's just gonna. It's, it's, it'd be messy. Yeah, yeah, it'd be messy. When that's, you talk about the open source data. Do you? Is there any? Um, are there DBS people in that open source no, data? Too? No, there's no. not. So the um, the. The prospective study, the small pilot grant, mm -hmm. um, they're getting the, the brain imaging, they're getting the neuropsych because they are DBS patients. Mm -hmm. So that's not, you know, we're focusing on them pre-DBS, um, but, you know, if that leads to a follow-up, it certainly could. I don't have any specific reason to think. Let me say this. I'm not going to investigate DBS outcomes in those individuals. Um, would it make sense that individuals with greater neuroinflammation may have some negative outcomes following an invasive brain surgery? Yeah, probably. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe in the future. And with DBS, um, you know, imaging with uh, the metal electrode, uh, that's, yeah, that causes challenges. Um, okay, well, thank you all. I appreciate your attention.